and I am behind, I know, on posting those, so I'm going to have to set aside some time specifically to do that here in the next uh, few days, so stay tuned. I'll get those recordings up for you. And um, the game plan for tonight is going to be to um, go through and look at uh, the remainder of chapter three, which was um, essentially uh, the data analytics discussion. And then we'll start to jump in to our chapter four material. Uh, we'll start talking about the specific procedures that we will um, conduct over various accounts, revenue, expense, and so on. So that's sort of uh, where we're going. Uh, in chapter four, when we get to chapter four, I'm going to reminding you of the assertions and how it's all about making sure that you know what procedures apply, apply to specific assertions. And we'll talk uh, more about that when we get to that. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, finish up chapter three with that remaining module that we had uh, related to data analytics. Now, uh, you hear a lot about data analytics. You hear a lot about auditing data analytics these days, and um, just going ahead and putting this into full screen, because um, we're going to use this abbreviation quite a bit, uh, auditing data analytics, we have abbreviated ADA, little S's, okay, so we see ADA, that's what we're talking about here. Um, now, when you hear about this currently, what you are tending to hear is how data analytics is going to be growing on the CPA exam. Expectations are that uh, you know entry level folks into the accounting profession will have more information, more knowledge about data analytics, and that's all true. Uh, but that more um, intensive procedural having you perform data analytics procedures is more looking towards the a uh, new exam that will come out in 2024 than the one that you're going to be sitting for. At this point, questions are still very much remembering and understanding. So what you're going to see here is a very much descriptive discussion of data analytics as opposed to an application of data analytics. Okay, So we're going to go through some of this and let's start out talking about benefits of uh, audit data analytics, okay, which we're abbreviating ADAS. And why don't we go ahead and flashcard a few of these benefits? Because again, this is the type of remembering and understanding question that the uh, exam likes to ask about. One of the key areas with data analytics, because of the power of these various software packages, IDEA, some of these other packages that are out there, they allow us to perform, uh, perform audit procedures. Remember, we talked about sampling last time. Instead of over just a sample of transactions in which there's always some potential that there'll be um, uncertainty due to sampling because the sample may not be representative of the population. In the case of a data analytics software procedure, you may be able to apply an audit procedure to an entire population. And if that's the case, then you don't have audit risk being affected by sampling techniques. Of course, there are non-sampling uh, audit risk issues, but uh, for those that are related to sampling, you would not have those if you're able to provide an audit procedure over an entire population. Um, also, enhanced fraud detection. So what happens with some of these software is they look for indicators of potential fraud, and they will literally flag and call out those transactions to you, which will enhance our ability to determine the financial statements or material misstated because of fraud. And of course, fraud has much more of a characteristic of management, um, qualitative characteristic of management um, that um, would obviously want us to be able to look closer at those. So flashcard, those couple of uh, important benefits to audit data analytics. Now, we're going to take a look at steps in applying those uh, accounting data, uh, auditing data analytics. And um, you can see that in planning, the is a step. Uh, and in this step also includes assessment of what data is needed, the most appropriate technique to employ, what tools, what are going to be the output, how will we use the uh, output 
put in assessing search specific outcome, material misstatement being the big one, obviously, in financial statement audit. Then we will need to clean and validate the data extraction. Now you start getting in and you can flashcard a couple of these key early steps, the planning and the cleaning and the validation extraction of the data. And then you can flashcard that we will use and analyze the relevance and the reliability of the data. And then, you know, I don't really need you to flashcard these additional steps because obviously you will then perform the data analytics and see whatever the analysis is. But these upfront steps might not be something that pops to mind and something that the question uh, that the exam questions might ask you about. Okay. Now, when we look, there are some broad categories uh, that we can talk about when we're looking at um, data analytics. Oh, let's look at some of the uh, tools and technology. I think you know spreadsheets, right? Analytical software, visualization soft visualization mining software. It might go through and flag certain transactions, et cetera. Okay. Now, when we come down to the techniques, and there are uh, various techniques, for example, descriptive analysis. Descriptive analysis is being achieved through descriptive analytical techniques, such as, and let's go ahead and flashcard some of these summary statistics. Okay. Data analytics lend themselves to that. Data storage, aging data and uh, data reduction. So you can flashcard some of those descriptive analysis that can be done. Diagnostic analysis, okay? And diagnostic analysis is going to basically try to explain to us why certain things are happening, okay? Correlations, patterns, relationships, okay? So we could have clustering. We could have drill down. Um, variance analysis, okay, period over period analysis. These are going to be diagnostic type of analysis. Now, we will tell us things that are happening, uh, but predictive analysis is going to be more something that is going to tell us what is going to happen, what will happen in the future. Regression analysis is something that we can use to see how there's a relationship between a uh, independent variable and a dependent variable. And then if those trends continue, we can uh, roll forward to see if we believe that that is going to continue in the future. Forecasting techniques is obviously predictive, time series modeling, classification, sentiment analysis. All of these would be examples of predictive analysis. And I'd like you to flashcard the examples here of predictive analysis. Okay, now going over and looking at perspective, um, prescriptive analysis, I should say, prescriptive analysis are more advanced and complex. Prescriptive analysis build on predictive analysis and shift the focus from addressing what will happen to how to make something happen. Okay, so flashcard that. And let's go ahead and take a look on the flashcard. Maybe you put on one side of the flashcard what I just had you flashcard. And then you say, what are some examples? What if analysis, decision support animation, automation, machine learning, natural language processing would be all examples of prescriptive analysis. Okay. Now, Getting back more to our auditing discussion, okay? And we talk about what? We talk about using data analytics here for risk assessment. What risk are we interested in assessing in a financial statement audit? The risk of material misstatement. So obviously some of these things are going to be important in helping us to determine if we have inherent risk, if we have control risk, okay? So, um, you can see that ADAs can be employed during the risk assessment process to identify previously unidentified risk, identify the risk of material misstatement at both the financial statement level and the assertion level. We have to assess fraud risk and assist in the determination of additional audit procedures that we need to apply. So we're really here saying to you, hey, look, 
you can use the data analytics to do all the things that we've been talking about that you have to do when you're making the assessment of the risk and material in the statement from the assessment of the risk to the determination of the further uh, audit procedures. Now, uh, one of the key areas that RMM helps with, and um, you can go ahead and put down here, are analytical procedures. Okay, analytical procedures, these data software packages are such that you can look for relationships and develop expectations of outcomes. That's where our data analytical procedures do, and those will be helpful for you in then making your assessment of the risk and material misstatement, focusing your um, analysis on accounts that seem more susceptible to risk than others. Now you come over and we talk about the use of data analytics and test of controls. And to me, the big deal here is that it becomes easier to test, that says easier to test entire populations. So now instead of having to select a sample to see if there's some indication of a supervisor review or something, you can do use a data analytics software to extract an entire universe population and look for whatever characteristic. We use the example, is there credit approval? Well, if the credit approval exists in some sort of electronic format, you can look to see every single transaction has that electronic stamp or whatever it is of that credit approval, and then you don't have to perform a sample there, okay? So you can see uh, review data for an, uh, abnormalities, anomalies that are likely to result from a, a control failure. Where is the credit approval? How come there wasn't some information? Giving the credit score, right? Maybe you have the credit score and you will only offer credit to those individuals that had a credit score of X or higher, okay? And then you can look and you can see through the entire population, did we issue credit to anyone with a credit score that was lower? Now you have what? A list of exceptions that you can look at and help you to assess the risk, um, the control risk in that case. Aid and reperformance activities, okay? You can go ahead and assuming there's some sort of automated control, you could reperform that control to see if it's effective and maybe finding um, some sort of errors that you maybe you put in. In um, remember, we talked about the uh, test uh, deck approach in which we do well, we put fictitious transactions in with real transactions. You could put some fictitious transactions in with real, with, with period. You don't even have to mingle with, with real transactions, put those in and see if your data. Uh, uh, data analytics software identifies those problems if it's supposed to do the same thing that the client system is supposed to do. Okay, then you come over and you take a look at substantive procedures. Okay, and again, when we talk about this and we say it can be applied both to test of details, okay, and test of details, again, probably entire populations is where data analytics really comes in for testing of details or for analytical procedures. And I've already pointed to the um, benefit of data analytics for analytical procedures. The thing, I think you kind of see me curling my brow a little bit here, that I don't like about them now all the calling out, all of a sudden calling out test of details. Test of details is also what part of the control testing, right? When we test the detail, we do control testing and substantive testing. So I don't really like that they went ahead and just teased out test of details here, okay? But when you get into test of details and sort of the thing that I've been har harping on here the whole time, you can test what? Entire populations. That's the real benefit of these um, audit data analytics. And then of course, uh, analytical procedures. Um, I was on an assignment, not a financial statement audit. Uh, we were looking at um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development on an assignment that I was on. And um, the uh, issue was that one housing agency had um, gone through and got funding from HUD, from the federal government. Housing agencies are local entities. 
and they've gotten funding from the federal government. And the funding that they got from the federal government was to tear down some public housing. And it was in the Miami-Dade area. They tore down the high-rise public housing because the studies were that when you create this high-rise public housing, you're just creating towers of poverty and that you're better off if you have public housing that has more like a regular, say, apartment and has, and you have actually mixed financing. You have some market units in there as well as some housing subsidized markets. That that was a better model for public housing. So the HUD created a program, it's called the HOPE program, in which the federal government would give money to these housing agencies to tear down the old housing structures and build um, you know, newer housing structures that would meet this new model. Well, what happened in Miami is they got the money, they tore down the housing, and then they proceeded to squander the money that they had and couldn't build anything back. So what they ended up doing was creating homelessness and rather than creating this. Well, that didn't go over too well with the you know individuals that were, had lost their homes and were now homeless. And so Congress asked the GAO to look at that. Well, GAO doesn't get involved in looking at one housing agency, particularly if there's allegations of fraud and whatnot. That's the job of the HUD Inspector General. So I got put on this assignment to somehow figure out how we would address the requester's concerns about Miami while talking about the overall system. So what we did was we pulled Miami's financial reports and we looked to see if there were indicators that would have uh, shown that these problems were about to emerge and boil over into you know, poor funding and allegations of fraud and whatnot. And so we developed some indicators and then we compared those to, fraud, uh, to HUD's system for identifying these problems and found that uh, in the case of Miami, there were uh, certain indicators like bounce checks that were showing that there was a problem. Meanwhile, the financial score that HUD was awarding to that housing agency was showing that everything was fine. Well, if you're in good financial condition, you're not bouncing checks. So now the story about data analytics. So what we did was we ran that same analytic against the entire population of all 31 housing agencies. We downloaded their financial reports. We sat there and we did the analysis. We compared it to HUD scores and we found out of the 3,100 housing agencies, we found that there were uh, over 300 that had the same problem as Miami. They were bouncing checks, but they were showing uh, the, the financial score given by HUD was showing that they were in good financial condition. That's the kind of thing that data analytics will allow you to do and allow you to report things at a universal level. There was no sample and therefore is it significant if this many out of, we just could speak to out of the population, these are how many are exhibiting this characteristic. Okay, So that's the kind of thing that uh, we're talking about there with testing entire populations. And of course, uh, performing data analytics is significantly enhanced uh, by the um, using these different uh, uh, procedures that we're talking about, the, um, the uh, auditing data analytics. Now, uh, concluding the audit, don't forget that you have to, auditors must conduct final review. And I kind of don't like the word final review because Becker has the product that we're going to look at later called the final review product. So we don't mean that, that you must conduct your final review. We mean must auditors, again, let's put down auditors, must conduct final review um, analytical procedures. That says analytical procedures at end of audit. Remember, we said that you must use those in the planning, which we've already talked about here. You must what do them at the end as a final review procedure, which I'm writing in here. And then you may want to apply data analytics as a substantive test. And again, uh, going back to our little example, when we talked about applying a data analytic procedure as a substantive test, we talked about linking washing machine revenue to the water bill. 
Well, you could, I don't know which for that, that you'd have to do regression analysis to prove that there is that kind of a uh, relationship. But if you wanted to get fancy, I guess you could go ahead and gallons of water on the x-axis, on the y-axis, what, washing machine revenue, and see if you have a line that shows a positive correlation between those two, right? And that would be a good data analytic uh, that you might perform as a um, substantive procedure or as a final review procedure, or you could even do it as a planning procedure and go from there, okay? Now, the data sources, okay? Data sources will come from the accounting information system, maybe the management information system. Perhaps management is tracking the use of electricity or something. Well, you might be able to throw that into uh, a data analytic and so you can get information from there. Okay. Now we talk about how data could be uh, stored in databases, data lakes, data cubes, data warehouses, data marts are all examples of different ways to uh, store data. So why don't you just go ahead and flashcard that. Remember, we're talking about remembering and understanding type questions here. Now, when we look, we can have what? internal reporting sources, such as the audit of financial statements, transaction logs, subsidiary general ledgers, but also external sources, such as government entities, private external sources, okay, uh, service organizations that provide various information. Um, which do you think is more reliable, internal or external? External. External, right? Good. Yeah, the more reliable stuff. So if you can get some sort of external government data, that kind of thing, you'd be more interested in that. Um, you'd, you'd be very interested, I shouldn't say more interested, because it really depends on what is more suitable for whatever the objective of the procedure is. But certainly, if you can find external data that helps with the procedure in a you know reasonable manner, then you'd want to get that from an external source. Okay. All right. Now, how can data be arranged, guys? And this is like no duh. Structured data has consistent data formats, is easily searchable, etc. Okay. So you can flashcard structured data. Okay. Unstructured data is what? Unstructured. I don't know what to tell you. Okay. It's not going to be structured in those various scenarios. And of course, unstructured data would be more difficult to work with than structured data. Um, the nice thing about the work that I talked about that we did with HUD is HUD has, it's not like we were dealing when we pulled information from the financial reports of housing agencies. It's not like you have this sort of you know, flexibility in how entities show their financial statements. I mean, even if you were to look up the financial statements of a public company, you see different weird things. You know, I've seen cases where sometimes they use parentheses to indicate an ad. Sometimes, you know, on the financial statements, they use parentheses to indicate a subtract. Okay, that gets a little bit difficult if you're trying to do some sort of data analytics across a whole bunch of companies or something. Whereas uh, in the case of HUD, HUD had a specific format that they made companies fill out to put in their um, financial reports to HUD, and then those were audited. So we had what? We had reliable data, and it was highly structured, would allow us to uh, go ahead and do that analysis across all the housing agencies. It was one line item on the financial statements. They called it, what did they call it? It was checks that they had bounced. They reported it as a liability and they called it outstanding checks was the name that they gave to it. It was checks that they had bounced. It wasn't outstanding. They had bounced those checks and they were reporting those as a liability, of course, which you should. And so it was easy for us to run an analysis across all of the 310 line items on all the financial statements of the housing agencies and then get into a different database where they were listing their financial scores against a HUD database that had that information, compare the two, okay? That's the kind of thing that you're looking for, data analytic. Unstructured data, you could still do that, but it is a typically you know, more difficult to do a, a data analytic against unstructured data, okay? Now you come over and you start to look at data reliability, okay? And let's take a look at these. And the majority of data is sourced from some type of information system. As a result, 
an audit will typically perform general IT control testing to ensure sufficient controls in information that you're getting from internal uh, sources. Remember, I talked to you last time, if you're going to use data and a data analytic, you want to make sure that that data that you're getting is reliable. And so you may start to ask them some questions about the reliability of that data. Um, you know, one of the first questions I would always ask is, have you done a data reliability assessment of your information systems? Often the entity will tell you, well, yes, we've done this because we've had certain funding uh, requirements that make us do this, whatever it is. And if they've done that, then you don't have to go ahead and do that work yourself. You could just rely on the independent analysis that would be done of the reliability of their data. Okay. Now, looking at some of the reliability procedures here, and um, let's just take a look at a couple of things just to give you a sense of what you're trying to come away with here. So um, if you come down, perform sequence test on pre-numbered documents to be sure that you have completeness of information. Okay, I'm not trying to... Let me see. I'm going to do that. I guess I'll do red here to make sure that you have come. Well, it's not red, but it's underlying completeness of information. So, if you are going to be pulling, say, a sample from a subsidiary ledger, you might want to make sure that what all the documents are sequentially accounted for. Okay. If you're doing it over the course of the year and the first document that was used at the start of the year was 300 then you'd want to make sure that there was an accounting for what every single document 300 to the last one. Is there one missing in there? How come? These data analytic procedures will help you uh, to do that. Okay, Reconciling data utilizing known aggregation points and accounting rules provided within the accounting information system. When you pull the sample, and I think I mentioned this last time, if you're testing accounts receivable on the balance sheet, and then you're going to pull a sample from the subsidiary ledger um, accounts, then you better make sure that what that the subsidiary ledger reconciles at a GL level. And of course, obviously, that the GL um, that's being reported in the GL is what they're reporting on their financial statements. So you can see aggregating transaction data to tie to subsidiary ledgers, aggregating subledger balances to general ledger, and then tying the general ledger. Uh, to the financial statements. This sounds like, you know, no kidding, no kidding, John, you know, that, that's nothing earth shattering. Well, I've been on assignments where folks aren't going to do this. And we're sorry, we're going to have to go back and make sure that the, before we start pulling any samples, it ties up, right? And then employ, employ the assistance of specialists for evaluating data. And sometimes, um, you will have a department within a firm that that's what they do. They do a data reliability assessment over any information systems that were used uh, in forming any conclusions um, on the audit. Okay, good. Now we come over and we start talking about data visualization. And this is greatly enhanced by the fact that you have um, these different uh, data uh, analytic, you know, how are you going to visualize uh, what you find. It's an integral part, okay? So it's easy as accountants, I think, for us to sit there and think, ah, visual, visual. No, this is important, not only for the auditor, but it also helps you to communicate things to what? To the board of directors, those charged with governance, right? And so where you can employ that to senior management that may not be as involved in the details of things. Sometimes these visualization techniques are important. Uh, in my um, one of my in some of my classes, I require the students to uh, analyze the financial statements of a chosen entity. They get to choose the entity, and I ask them uh, to uh, provide me a three-page written summary of what they see, answering certain rubric questions against um, you know what they find when they look at the 10K, let's say. And a lot of times students will say, well, can I have graphics? And I said, well, yeah, don't give me three pages of graphics, but yeah, sure, some graphics. They say, well, what are examples of some graphics? I provide them with this right here. I say, okay, you know what? Here are some different ways that you can explain, visualize what you're finding as you go through and do your analysis, okay? So let's go through and let's just take a look 
at some of the uh, uh, visual uh, representations of the different data analytics that we talked about. And can a regression analysis allow the R to evaluate relationships between variables? Now, um, <laughs> So we use uh, scatter plots to do that. Okay, and I'm not sure why they did not put in the scatter plots. Oh, there it is. That's my bad. I highlighted the wrong line. Scatter plots, okay, is the way to do that. And go ahead and put down illustration 11. I'm not sure why they mentioned scatter plots there and then threw them onto the different page. Okay, but we'll look at that here in a second. Okay, variance analysis. Okay, a good way to visualize variant analysis is a bullet chart. Okay, that shows lines that designate when we are below, under the budget, whatever. And that's an example of the bullet chart. And you can see those green lines are representing the budget and it's showing what? When we are under, below budget, very quick, easy to see what's going on there. Okay, so you can go ahead and flashcard that. Flashcard the regression analysis is good for using scatter uh, scatter plots is a good way for regression analysis, variance analysis, bullet chart. Okay, coming over period over period analysis, and they're saying that these bar charts are good for periods. Bar columns are good for period over period. Okay, so you can just go ahead and flashcard that. I think you could probably figure that out, but since they're calling out specific types of visualizations that are good for specific types of analysis, I think that's a good thing for us to flashcard. Okay, classification. Classification, they're telling us what pie chart is a good way, okay, or a tree map. So you could flashcard that for classification, and you come over. And as I said, I'm not sure why they put the scatter plot in here, which we, oh, you know, I know why they put it here, but I don't know why they put it over here so far from where we mentioned it, but that was regression analysis. Okay, but regression analysis, I don't know, I can't spell it. Regression analysis, what it does is it says, look, this relationship has some sort of correlation. They kind of fit a line to that and they come up with a, a formula that basically says Y equals MX plus B. And even though the points obviously don't line up perfectly along that line, you get a sense as to the correlation and um, Excel will literally tell you what your uh, correlation is and it'll give you the correlation of determination and these sort of things that allow you to determine, is there a linear relationship here? Do these things not move in concert or are they random? And so then you can sort of uh, visualize what you see by performing that scatter point and seeing how things fit along a certain line. And then, as we said, categorization, pie charts are the classic way to categorize, okay? Trend analysis, and guys, I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence here by going over these things with you, but I do want to indicate to you what I want you to flashcard, okay? Trend analysis, line charts are good to determine trends over time. I think you know that, okay? But just go ahead and flashcard that because, again, you've got a lot of things you need to remember on the exam. And so I want you to just kind of have crisp in your mind the connection between the different visualization techniques and the different analysis, okay? All right, good. Now you come over and uh, how will we use in a financial statement audit? We're interested in figuring out whether or not we have uh, material misstatements. Now, we can group those by having a certain threshold as to what is inconsequential. And we can group our items into those that are what? that are obviously inconsequential, okay? And so we would basically want to understand if something is clearly inconsequential, okay? They do not pose a risk of material misstatement, either individually or in aggregate, okay? So we're going to go ahead and group those. Obviously, we can do what? Push those misstatements to the side, right? Then what? Then we will start to look at those that are not clearly inconsequential. And now we're going to have to start to determine, well, do they have by themselves? 
indicate a material misstatement? Do they have the potential of aggregating with other clearly inconsequential? Okay, so we would have to determine and we may group these into common characteristics to see if maybe they're going to build up into a material misstatement, even though they may not be material in and of themselves what would be the possible misstatements um, as a result of that, okay? All right, good. So with all that, that gives us a sense as to some of the things that we will be able to do with auditing data analytics. So let's just go ahead and take a look at our first question tonight. And um, we're going to go ahead and uh, launch the poll for this. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end this uh, question because I look at it and I'm like, okay, poor Amber. I mean, who put her up to asking these other questions in here? I mean, <laughs> this is like teasing, you know, your new staff and asking them um, to go in and um, everybody got it right here. Okay. You know, <laughs> but I look at some of these other choices and, uh, I'm just annoyed. I'm like, request that Blissful Springs provide report daily weather information. I mean, Blissful Springs gonna look at her and say, are you kidding? You think we track data? I mean, look at the government website, right? That shows what the data was. I mean, we have, you know, entities in the government all over the world that track weather patterns and whatnot. So, you know, trying to get all these, or asking management, what are the weather patterns impact? You know, come on now. That's a little silly. So some of these other, this is obviously a Becker written question where somebody just felt they had to put something down and came up with something. Somebody decided to put it here. Obviously external government is the key phrase there. Okay, good. Let's go ahead. Let's take a look at this one. We're going to be spending more time on that sort of question. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll because it looks like uh, just about everybody's had a chance to try this one, okay? 
And uh, yeah, 100%, scatter plot is the way to go with regression analysis. So everybody everybody got this one, right? The answer is C. Scatter plot is the way to visualize regression analysis. Okay. All right, good. Any questions as we complete chapter three here now? Okay. All right, good. So now that we are done with chapter three, let's go ahead and close that and let's jump us into chapter four okay so what have we been doing we talked about the reports in chapter one we talked about high level planning considerations in chapter two okay both important chapters i'm not trying to discount them chapter three had to know our risk assessments right and how we respond to those risk assessments and we talked about from a general standpoint how our assessments of risk affect up and down our substantive procedures, right? Well, now what we're going to do is say, okay, you've made your assessment of risk, but what procedures are specific to various account transactions, account cycles, okay, that affect our financial statements? Now, when you go through this, it can be a little overwhelming in that you're thinking, you mean to tell me I'm gonna to have to sit here and memorize procedures that are relevant to the revenue cycle. And my answer to you is not really, okay? What I, I know, there are some procedures I will ask you to flashcard because they're absolutely, you know, peanut butter, chocolate cake and Kool-Aid type of, you know, things that they're gonna ask you. And so I'm gonna have you flashcard those, okay? But, they're, um, but for the most part, what I'm gonna ask you to do is understand what assertion the question is indicating that you're asking for and know what the best procedure is for that assertion, okay? So we're gonna kind of have to turn on a little bit of our thinking cap here as opposed to our memorization cap for some of these things, okay? All right, good. So let's just go ahead and um, let me put things back in. Full screen mode. Okay, I'm fighting a little bit with the taskbar for um, Zoom here. Okay. Okay, I'm getting a request to load chapter four to the class. And guys, I've asked several times about getting your textbooks and whatnot. So, what's going on? you're asking for this because you don't have your textbook oh i have my textbook but i just use my ipad to take notes mostly okay yeah okay well i you know okay we, we really should be uh, at some point using the textbook but okay yeah thanks i'll, I'll go ahead and put it up okay um Sometimes Becker gives me a little bit of a funny look when I tell him I'm loading the PDFs up because uh, now they're worried that people are going to start sharing those with 50,000 of their closest friends. But let me see if I can um, accomplish that without getting out of laptop um, tablet mode. So what do I want to do here? Let me see what I got open. I think I can close that now. Okay, new window. Golden Gate University. Are you guys, you know, just dawned on me to ask, are you guys um, seeing those postings about the different events that Ascend and the Accounting and Tax Club are putting on, such as inviting KPMG and some of the firms to the, are you seeing those? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I would highly recommend going to some of those things. I don't think I've seen many of you in there. and. Uh, you know, worst case scenario, you make a connection with a potential recruiter that maybe can help you to learn more about an opportunity at that firm or willing to look at a resume or something like that. So those are typically on Fridays. 
um, and they run from like five to six. So it's not that huge of a time investment and you go to some of those things. Um, so you might think about that going to some of those. If you have questions on how to um, attend those, just let me know. I'll forward you some information on that. Send me an email. Okay, let's see. Chapter four. And first thing I have to do is chapter four. Show section. And then I have to go and hide some of these because I don't want you to get confused. Those are old lectures. I need to put up the new lectures. Okay, and then add an activity or resource. Yeah, they're going to ask me to name the file and that's going to be problematic. I don't know if it is going to let me bring up a keyboard. Let me see. Yeah, well, that's a deal breaker. I can't do it without taking the computer out of. Um, Try uh, hitting that little keyboard icon in the lower right hand corner next to that little speaker thing on your taskbar. Right here. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. So what am I looking for? Chapter. Or I'll just call it PDF. I think you all know what we're doing here. Okay. Okay, good. Then I can just close that. Okay, good. And then I should be able to get the file without a whole bunch of problem. Audit class. Okay, should be there now. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at Okay, close that now and come back to chapter four and let's go full screen. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at transaction cycles. Now, when we look at transaction cycles, okay, at a high, high level, guys, transaction cycles constitute Okay, constitute 30 points on the CPA exam. There is no way on your auditing exam, there is no way in the world to pass the auditing exam without knowing how to audit these transaction cycles. Now, not all transaction cycles are created equally though in terms of constituting that 30 points, okay? The revenue cycle is heavy. The expenditure cycle is heavy. Now, of course, as we're there, we're looking at what? We're looking at the income statement, okay? The cash cycle is heavy. The inventory cycle is heavy. And you're like, okay, John, are there any lighter ones? Yes. 
investment cycle is light. Okay. Now they talk about other transaction cycles, and that's a little annoying because um, they're sort of leaving out a bunch of cycles that could be high and low and why they're just throwing them all into other, I don't know, but I'll show you where they're going to give us more detail on that in a minute. Okay. Now you come over and they say matters that require special consideration. Okay. And we have litigation. Remember, if an entity is involved in litigation, they have to figure out if there's an unfavorable outcome. What is the probable unfavorable outcome? What is the range of losses? All those sort of things. Okay. So that's going to be five points. Okay. Another thing that they're calling special uh, consideration is uh, initial audits. If it's the first time an entity is going under audit, what are some considerations that we have to make there? That's pretty light. That's about two points. Okay. So just give you a sense of some of these other areas that they talk about. A uh, going concern. Consideration. Okay. That's about five points. Okay, so, you know, they've kind of listed this at a high level, but there are some fairly significant things that we need to be aware of in there. Okay, now when we talk about misstatements and internal control, that's 10 points. They expect you to understand what misstatements mean and what misstatement means in relation to potential weaknesses in the internal control. Communication and management uh, with management and those charged with governance uh, about uh, um, oh, excuse me, uh, written representation, okay, that is a five-point area. We'll talk about the management rep letter at the end, and communication with management, those charged with governance, that's about five points as well, okay? Okay, good. So you can see those different areas. I'm going to give you more information on these other transaction cycles in a minute, okay? But obviously, what? Transaction cycles, big deal, okay? All right, good. Now we come over and um, okay, they talked to us about the different places that we are on the audit. I mean, right now we're kind of right here, okay, performing the procedures to obtain evidence by cycle now, okay. And we start with the revenue cycle, and maybe I should have indicated the heavy versus the light of the 30 points here would have been a better place to do it, okay. So 30 points, okay, revenue is heavy. Expenditure is heavy, cash is heavy, inventory is heavy, investments are light. Other transaction cycles, okay, that they didn't call out up there in the outline. Property, plant, and equipment is medium. Now, that's a good thing for you. That property, plant, and equipment is medium means there's a fair number of points there. But the other thing I want to point out to you, it's important about understanding how to operate audit property, plant, and equipment, because you can what think about a physical manifestation of something and say, how am I going to audit it? Well, the idea, the procedures, okay, really don't differ much from auditing the assertion of the physical manifestation of something like a physical asset. So you can, by analogy, you understand how to audit property, plant, equipment. You can apply this to any of these other areas, okay? And then when we get to that, I'll point that out again. Um, obviously, property, plant, and equipment is the uh, balance sheet, okay? And then what? Payroll, and personnel, okay, that is what, that is heavy, that is going to be the income statement, okay, and then financing, okay, issuing stock, issuing debt is fairly light, and that obviously affects both the balance sheet and the income statement. I guess any account could affect both the balance sheet and the income statement, but, uh, you know, I'm just kind of indicating here the major financial statement that that will, in, that that will impact, okay. Okay, good. Now we start talking right away fraud related to the revenue cycle. Why are they talking about fraud related to revenue? That's always where the fraud is. I mean, you never read about financial statement reporting fraud over the office supply accounts. Okay, so it's always what? It's always revenue that ends up being the one that gets hit. And so you start to take a look at early revenue recognition. 
holding the books open past the close of the accounting period to see if we can get revenue from year two and channel that into revenue for year one. If maybe we think we're a little short, right, on revenue for year one. Fictitious sales, right? Failure to record a sale return. If there's a return, then our sales should come down, right? Our sales return should go up. Our net sales should come down. Side agreements used to induce customers who accept goods and services they otherwise do not need, what's going to happen? There's going to be a return pretty soon, isn't there? Okay. What else? Channel stuffing distributors to purchase more inventory than they can sell in the near term. Again, they're not going to be coming back anytime soon. Okay. All of these things relate to what? Overstatement, don't they? All of these things relate to overstatement. So if we're talking about overstatement, what assertion do you think will be damaged if there's an overstatement? What assertion? Valuation? No. Existence? Good. Existence. Okay. We're more worried. I understand, um, Michael, while you're, while you're saying valuation, because overstatement, you tend to think of the dollar amount, but it's really more existence. Existence, what? Occurrence. Did the sale really occur? So we're going to see that the procedures that we're going to be looking at are the real, real critical ones, not that we ignore the other assertions, but the very critical assertion that we're worried about for revenue is what is existence occurrence, because we're worried that what, and when they talk about the risk, and Becker says in some of this stuff, they say, well, the risk is more for overstatement than it is for existence occurrence and it is for completeness. And I'm like, what risk? The risk of material misstatement is predicated on what? Inherent risk and control risk. So it's not the risk of material misstatement they're talking about there. They're talking about what? They're talking about business risk to the CPA firm there. Because what happens? If we overstate revenue, then we're gonna overstate net income. We overstate net income. We're gonna overstate the net worth of the entity, aren't we? And that's when somebody's gonna come seeking damages. Not, I paid too little for the stock. I paid what? Too much for that stock, okay? So when they talk about the risk, risk of material statement is by definition a product of what? Inherent risk and control risk, but, you could have what? You could have certain things that are pushing the risk of material misstatement up for the revenue occurrence assertion if we're believing that what? There's something intentional going on here. So I guess from that standpoint, if we're talking about fraud risk, yeah, it is higher, which is what they're listing here, okay? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to flashcard these fraud risk schemes, okay? Okay, good. Now we come over and we start to take a look at our sales, okay? And the the, the format here, guys, uh, excuse me for one second. Okay. I just need to open my window here because I start to get some funky shadows if I don't. And I also feel like I'm in a penitentiary if I don't open the window here. So anyway, okay, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look. And um, the pattern here is that we will look at the internal controls that are related to a particular cycle. And then we'll look at the substantive procedures, right? Okay, so when you look, at what we're doing here, okay, just to show you that little thing one more time, okay, we are and I know you get tired of seeing this, but I feel compelled to keep kind of putting this same uh, thing back up. What uh, drive am I in here? Okay, I gotta play hide and seek with me.
some reason I got this problem that Chrome is taking over my world and listing everything as a Chrome file. Okay, but we've had this. Um, this thing, okay, it took me long enough to get there. Okay, I don't know what worth it is, but remember, we've talked about what, hey, what is the potential misstatement, assess the risk, and then what? Do your control tests and then determine your substantive procedures. So we're kind of right here now. But the key reason I'm bringing this up is you line up what the controls that you're looking at and you line up your substantive procedure with the assertion. Keep that in mind. Okay. And once you feel comfortable how to audit assertions, you start to do very, very well on these kinds of questions that constitute the 30 points. And you will be a wizard at going through these questions. Time will not be nearly the constraint for you on the uh, audit exam as it is, say, on FAR or regulation or BEC. Okay. Okay, good. So let's just come over now back and let's just take a look. And they start out talking about various departments, okay, in the sales of revenue cycle. Now, when we look, we want to segregate what? We want to segregate the uh, functions, okay? And we're trying to segregate what functions? Authorization, record keeping, and custody. Those are the things we are trying to separate, and I write them in that order because we have the mnemonic arc, okay? So when you look at these departments, I mean, somebody will say, I guess it's Garrity or something because they show you flow charts and he dares to look you in the eye and the camera and say, memorize every flow chart. Who's going to do that? Nobody. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to sit here and you want to look at these departments. Is it an authorization department? Is it a record keeping department? Or is it a custody department? And then when a question says, which of the following would be performed by the, um, you know, uh, credit approval department, you're looking for what? The clear authorization step, right? Authorization, credit approval is an authorization step, okay? So that's how you want to remember these things is by what function do these different departments perform? And it's just the three, authorization, record keeping, or custody, okay? So preparation of the sales order, okay? That's done by the what? The sales department. And the sales department determines if the order can be filled, and then we have a uh, serially numbered sales order that is prepared and sent to the credit department. So what do you think? Is that authorization, record keeping, or custody? I'm asking you. Authorization? Yeah, it's authorization that there's actually a person standing here that wants to buy this stuff, right? Okay, okay, good. Well, then we send that to the credit department and the credit department will determine whether or not the customer received goods on credit. OK, now, why can't the sales department determine that the person has good credit? Why do I have to send it to a separate department? Because the sales people want sales. Yeah, the salesperson might say, well, okay, you know, you don't got the best credit. What's your credit rating? 500? Okay. No, okay. We're looking for somebody a little higher than that, let's say, right? And so what happens? You sit there and that is an authorization step, right? Now, why does the auditor care if the person is approved for their credit and therefore we can go ahead and start to send them the goods and whatnot? Why does the auditor care? It determines whether the customer can pay us or not. It determines if the customer can pay the client? Yes. Why does the auditor care? That's the valuation assertion for AR. Excellent. Valuation assertion. Everything we do has something to do with what? An assertion, doesn't it? Everything we do, and I tell 
uh, you know, my students this, and I used to tell them they were staff this. If you're applying an audit procedure and you don't know why you're doing it, you're not doing your job. If you're just sitting there and just kind of mindlessly doing something because the audit program said so, you need to step back and say, what are we trying to get out of this? We're looking at this credit approval process because it'll help us with evaluation assertion over accounts receivable, right? If they have good credit approval process, that means the chance that what? That they're not going to collect on the receivable is much less. That means they should necessarily not have to have as much in the valuation allowance and the allowance for doubtful accounts, right? So we don't have to put as much audit resources on what? on auditing the um, allowance for doubtful accounts. So we can sit there and we can do what? Maybe apply an analytical procedure and that helps us with what? The bad debt expense on the income statement. So it allows us to take a risk-based approach to determining how to allocate our audit resources, right? Because we don't have the whole rest of our lives to audit these financial statements. We don't have unlimited resources to do that. Okay, okay, good. Everything relates to an assertion. Good, so then we have what? We have the shipping department. Shipping department is going to be what kind of a department? Custody. Good, that's a custody department. And they prepare a bill of lading. Now, sometimes you see some of these terms that have been around since the 50s and you're like, what the hell is a bill of lading? And a bill of lading is what? A packing slip, isn't it? Okay, just list the things that are in that shipment. So when you get your stuff, you open it up. You know, okay, where's my, da, 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 here's my Becker book, whatever it is, right? Okay, okay, good. Then we have billing and billing and is what obviously record keeping, right? And the billing department prepares a serially numbered sales invoice, shipping documents, sales orders and invoices. And they can, they prepare the, invoice, but they compare that to shipping documents, sales uh, orders, and uh, to assure that all shipments were based on a valid customer order and were properly billed. Then what? Then the accounting department will enter those sales into the sales journal. Okay, so we got to get those customers billed. What was their order? What did we ship? All of that then is important in determining uh, that we can now properly bill that customer. We now have an account receivable, okay? Now, when we come down to the account receivable, we say a receivable is recorded in the account receivable control account in the general ledger and the account receivable subsidiary ledger. So the subsidiary ledger obviously needs to do what? Tie up to the general ledger. And how frequently you make sure that happens really depends on the nature of the entity. I'm here to tell you right now, if you're a bank, no one goes home until that all reconciles. Other businesses maybe won't uh, be as intense about that, okay? Now we come over and periodically an independent person should reconcile these two. Flashcard that I don't like the use of the phrase independent because who's the only independent person in the room when we're doing an audit? The auditor. The auditor. Okay. So when they say independent, perhaps internal audit staff. But remember, internal audit staff are what? they are not independent, okay? They are maybe independent of some of the processes we're talking about, but they are not independent. Only the external auditor, only the CPA is considered independent, okay? Okay, good. Now, we take a look and we talk about uncollectible receivables, and we say that an aging schedule is prepared, okay? Aging schedule shows what? how far behind payments are, and that then drives what goes into the allowance. If somebody is current, we maybe only put 1%. If somebody is you know, 90 days late, maybe we're gonna put 20% of their receivable into the allowance, right? And it's based on past experience. Now, we come over and we say the agent schedule is prepared by who? By the client. But auditor does what? inspects and observes. Let me put auditor up there. Auditor 
is the one that what inspects and observes, but the schedule is prepared by what by the client, right? And maybe the auditor would take a look at that. And that is sent to the credit department for their collection prog prog uh, program, but the client prepares that. At some point, what uncollectible receivables should be written off and it is what to be written off by the treasurer. It is to be written off by the treasurer. Okay, so that is what, that is an authorization for write-off that comes from the treasurer, flashcard that. We don't want people who have custody of accounting records and custody of checks and receivables that are coming in. They have the ability to write those off because they'll write them off and steal the money, right? Okay, so that is coming from a high level that is done by the treasurer for proper authorization. Okay, okay, good. I don't know why I had to write authorization because it's right there, but you get the point. Okay, now come over and sales returns. Okay, and we can use a receiving report. Now you're saying, wait a minute, I thought the receiving report was when we get shipped inventory for resale. Well, it could also be used for what? For items that are returned, okay? Or maybe you have a special receiving report for return goods. Now, if somebody returns stuff, do we expect that they're gonna pay us for it if they return it? No. Okay, so if that's the case, how would you account for that in terms of an accounting entry? If someone's not owing you money anymore, you, you would accounts receivable. Definitely, we're going to what credit AR, and we're going to debit either sales or sales returns. I think most company would probably have a sales returns account that they would debit, right? Okay. So what else? You would increase your inventory. Good. I'd have to credit inventory and credit what? I'd yeah, have to debit inventory sold. and credit the cost of goods sold. Okay, excellent. Okay, just to think through the journal entries here. So when they say a credit memo, okay, that's the credit they're talking about right there, right? Okay, that we're crediting the individual's account. And um, note that credit memos should not be issued by someone who collects cash. Hello, let's flashcard that. But obviously, if someone's collecting cash and accounting for the collection of cash, what would they do? Keep the cash and just simply credit the person's account receivable, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now we come over. We've got some receivables out there. And uh, the idea is that we should get some cash out of that, right? So incoming mail must be opened to a person who does not have access to the receivable ledger, okay? And the receipts should be listed in detail with three copies, okay? Now, when we say the receipts are listed in detail, okay, that is called a remittance advice. You'll see that term, remittance advice. That's saying, hey, we got some cash in, okay? So what happens? One copy of that remittance advice will go to the cashier along with the check for a deposit into the bank, okay? So they will fill out what? They will fill out a deposit ticket and take it to the bank. So notice you have what? Somebody opening the mail, they're sending the checks and the remittance advice to the cashier, okay? Now, sometimes in smaller entities, you may have that all in one function if they don't receive a lot of mail. But if you have a situation where they're receiving tons of mail and there's checks in there, somebody's got to sort that out, okay? So then they'll send that to the cashier with the remittance advice saying, these are the checks that we got. The cashier receives that remittance advice. They prepare a deposit ticket for everything that's going to be deposited, right? Then what? The accounts receivable department will get those remittance advices, and they're going to sit there and see there was a check from Michael, there was a check from Roy, there was a check from Melissa, and they're going to go through and they're going to update everybody's account in the subsidiary ledger, and there will be a total on that remittance advice. So in the accounting department, they'll do what? They will enter the total 
into, they don't enter each receipt into the account receivable control account. Account receivable control account is a summary account, right? But they'll compare the total to what is listed on that remittance advice to see that they have entered for every check that was there, the total, right? Okay, and as we said, periodically, someone's going to reconcile the subsidiary ledger to the general ledger. We say periodically, that could, in many cases, be done daily. Okay, now, let's just go ahead, though, and now that we understand where these remittance advices go, let's just flashcard some key things that happen here. Okay, so the accounts receivable department should match the details from the bank deposit ticket with the details on the remittance advices. And once they see, okay, remittance advice, check was deposited, update the customer's account, right? That they paid, okay? Then what? And it says, this will reveal any discrepancies. So that's an internal control, isn't it? That's an internal control, I'm putting IC, because that's an internal control that the client has put in place to help over what? over the existence completeness of cash okay then what then we come over and they tell us cash collection should be restrictively endorsed upon receipt deposited daily and devices such as cash registers or lock boxes should be used these are all what internal control flashcard that of these which do you think would be the most reliable control? The lockbox. What is a lockbox? And they say devices, which is misleading. What is a lockbox? A safe. Yeah, see, they make, they, they kind of pull you into that there because they call it a device. A lockbox is a function that's offered by banks in which the checks are sent what? directly to the bank. So there's no temptation on the part of the employees to start pulling scams or they're going to start to start to steal the checks and whatnot, right? Okay. So that probably is the most effective control because it involves a third external party, right? An external third party. Okay, good. Now again, as I mentioned, it's just I get a little annoyed when I hear the national lectures say something silly like memorize all the um all the flow charts and I'm just like no way come on that's ridiculous a poor person sits there tries to do that you go you know you could go insane trying to memorize one of these things okay so what I want you to do though is flashcard what the functions that are performed by the various departments isn't that what we've been saying is the key thing yeah that's a good flashcard okay high level thing Okay, good. And I circled the write off there, treasurer. I've already asked you to flashcard that, that that's an authorization by the treasurer. Okay, okay, good. Now you come over and when we deal with our cash collections, okay, and they do a nice job here of telling us what kind of function is being prepared, uh, being performed by these different departments, authorization, record keeping, custody. Now, when I look at this, okay. I'm like, do I need authorization here? They don't put any authorization. Should there be an authorization over cash collection? I'm thinking, yeah, authorization. And that authorization should probably be done what? probably at the accounts receivable level, okay, for the collection, okay, so there should probably be an accounts receivable authorization that gets done because most likely we're going to do what, we're going to have this mail come in, the check's going to come in, the cashier is going to want to deposit that, we definitely want to get that into our accounts, but then the question is, did this check come from somebody who actually owes us money? maybe the person accidentally cut a check to us and what's going to happen we want to see okay there is an actual balance here to apply this against and if not we're going to kick that money back to them almost immediately we don't want to be sitting here racking up these large you know uh inappropriate collections and then one day we get hit over the head and somebody asks us for 10 million dollars back right so 
there probably would be an authorization function that I think would happen in the accounts receivable department there. Okay. Okay, good. Now we talk about testing controls and Vector keeps going back and forth with themselves, deciding whether this should be in an appendix or whether it should be here in the middle of the discussion. So we have the control procedure and we have a sample test of the control, okay, that would go into these various departments. I don't want you guys to sit here and try to memorize a list of control procedures and sample test of control procedures. I want you to understand how a control procedure would be effective in helping with what? An assertion, right? And we've talked about that. And so you can scan this, but I don't want to sit here and call off 52 control procedures and then sit there and, um, you know, have you overwhelmed with trying to remember everything here. I'd much rather you understand you have an assertion, you have what? You have a control, and then you have a, uh, a test of that control that would line up with the assertion, okay? And they list the segregation of duties here, okay? And they do the same thing now for the test of controls over cash receipts and the segregation of duties. What we're going to look at here is specific procedures to obtain evidence. And guys, these are really, when they say specific procedures, they really mean substantive procedures. I don't have to put the word procedures again. They mean substantive procedures. Now, again, it's important to understand how controls will help you with the assertions, right? Okay, but um, then once you have evaluated how the controls help you with the assertions, then you want to make sure that you are comfortable um, with the substantive procedure that's going to give you evidence to help you detect a material misstatement. Okay, now um, they say that you're more interested in existence rather than completeness for sales. And I agree from a business risk standpoint, not an audit risk standpoint, unless there are fraud risk factors that you think are involved that maybe will be causing management to want to overstate their sales. So let's just take a second before our break, because I see we're coming up on break time. And let's look at a couple of things. And I'm going to co-op some of this space down here. So what happens? I have the financial statements, okay? And the financial statements do what? Feeding into them is the general ledger, okay? And then feeding into the general ledger are going to be what? Are going to be journals, And since we're talking about sales, let's go ahead and let's just the sales journal, but there are other journals, okay? And um, in this sales journal are listed sales, you think, okay? Um, let me just put my journal up there just so I have more room inside the sales journal. That says journals and just put sale here. Okay, and I have sale one, and I have sale two, and I have sale three, and I have sale four. Sale one is for 100,000. Sale two is for 50,000. Sales three is for 50,000. And sales four is for 10 million. Okay. Um, and then let's say I have, um, let's say I have sale five down here for um, five million. Okay. Now what happens over here? I have documents and some documents that we're going to see that we're going to be talking about a little bit later after the break are the sales invoices. 
Okay, and I'll have one, two, three. Okay, I can get rid of that. I want to get rid of that cell file, just erase that cell file. So I have one, two, three, sales invoice one, two, three, and I have sales invoice 17 over here. Okay, all right, good. So I come over and I also have shipping documents. Okay, so what do I do? I come over and I sample this transaction from, well, first of all, guys, and you see a lot talked about in the textbook, the auditor should reconcile the general ledger to the subsidiary ledger. Acting like that's some big audit procedure. What would you do if you went on an audit and the general ledger didn't match the subsidiary ledger or the journals, what would you do? What would you tell the client? Fix your, it. Your, your sales journal says you had a total amount of sales of you know $50 million and your general ledger says your sales were 20 million. What would you say to them? I would tell them to fix it. They yeah, I'd say, yeah. I'd say, well, bye. I'll be back when you have figured out this cluster, you know, what of an accounting system you have right now, right? Or if you want to pay me to sit here and figure out your mess, that's going to what? be a lot different than the engagement we were thinking going in, right? Okay, this thing doesn't reconcile. Okay, so the assumption is that's going to reconcile on the auditing exam. I mean, you would do this as a step, but they don't ask a lot of questions about that reconciliation between, I've never really seen a question where they really ask, is that a good audit procedure? Of course it has to be done. Okay. But now what I do is I come over and I sample that sale and I come over and I find, and I probably should have written these in a different order, but whatever, I find this, I, I would have started with the invoice, to be honest with you. And then I would have found the shipping document for that sale one. And the invoice says, yeah, 100,000. Does that match? Yes. Okay, so that matches. So what assertion, Michael, did I just test with that? That would be completeness because you're making sure it flows through. Well, if it's completeness, um, how did I find something that was missing there? Completeness means something that should have been recorded wasn't, right? I think that's existence. existence. Right? So that's existence, right? Michael? Okay. We're good with that. Okay. That's yeah, existence. That it's, it's there. Does it exist? Is there some support that says they ship this stupid thing, right? Okay, good. All right. So I do that for this second one. And again, I probably should have put the invoices first because typically you'd find the invoice and then you'd match it to the shipping document, whatever. Okay. Um, but that one existed, didn't it? Oh, well, number two. Come on, John. Pay attention to what you're doing. Okay. You're not going to mess here. Right, number two is going to be for fifty thousand. Okay, so I do some uh, existence tests, right? That's also existence. Okay, now what? Now I go and I start with my sales invoice, and that sales invoice says that that was for fifty thousand. And I come over and I find the shipping document. Yep, they shipped it. And I find it in here. What test was that? What assertion did that test? Okay. We'll see that's for completeness. That. Okay, that's completeness because something should have been recorded based on that shipping document, and it was, wasn't it? I can see that. Okay, 
let's say I pick this number 17. And let's say the invoice says that this number 17 was a sale for $5 million. And I come over and I find the shipping document. And I come over, do you see a sale number 17 over here? No. There is no sale number 17. So what an auditor, I did what? I found, that's not there. I'm crossing that out because it's not there. I found a transaction that was not recorded. I found what? An exception in the complete assertion by what? Starting with the supporting documents and trying to find them in the financial statements, right? And it wasn't there, okay? Let's say I picked this sale number four to for 10,000 and I come over, I mean for 10 million and I come over and I what? I try to find it. Is there a shipping document for it? No. Is there a sales invoice for it? No. I don't see any. So I come over and I say, uh, management, what is this? We've got this sale number four for $10 million, a pretty big one, but we can't find a shipping document. We can't find a sales invoice. And they say to us, oh, oh yeah, that was Bob. You know, Bob used to make that mistake all the time. We finally let him go and we've got that cleaned up now, okay? Are your fraud professional skepticism uh, spidey senses lining up right now? Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me look at some more transactions that were processed by this Bob. Where is Bob now? Why was this happening? Did Bob misunderstand? Was Bob, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, turned into the authorities? I mean, what happened with this Bob, right? You start asking these questions. How about this other one with the completeness assertion where there was something that they didn't book? And they sit there and they say to us, um, well, um, th this 5 million, this 17, this 5 million that we didn't find. Um, and uh, they say to us, oh, yeah, Bob used to make that mistake, too. What's that doing to your spidey senses? They oh, didn't yeah. report a sale they were supposed to. They screwed up the completeness assertion. They should have recorded 5 million, the stale 17. They did not. That's the completeness assertion. What's bothering you there? Is your spidey sense, are, are, your, are your professional skepticism alarms going off there? Yeah, you'd be wondering what's going on. What's going on? Why would they want to understate sales? Because the Becker books kept saying, the problem you're worried about is existence, not completeness. And they keep saying that. Shouldn't this bother you? Maybe they decided they've had enough sales for year one. They met their sales target for year one. It wouldn't be nice if we got to start on year two by including that in year two. Okay, so that's why I get a little annoyed when they say, well, what's the risk? The business risk, okay, but the risk, the risk of material misstatement associated with the assertion has not gone away. Okay, and so you would need to consider that and perform some procedures around that. Okay, good. So that's a visual that you can take to the break with you now, and then we'll come back and we'll start to look at how they talk about that kind of stuff here in the text here and the written uh, prose here in the text after the break. Okay, so let's go ahead. Let's come back at what, 650, and we'll jump ourselves back into. Um, the discussion of the text here.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and start back. And I think I forgot to pause the recording. So when you look back at this, if you do, uh, you probably will want to fast forward through that, obviously. But um, let's go ahead and let's take a look at our um, substantive procedures now is what they're listing here. And um, substantive procedures that are being named here, but don't forget, um, you would also test some controls as well. And they really don't mention much about control testing. These really are more substantive uh, procedures. Now, um, the, uh, the, we're gonna list them by assertions. And remember the assertions fall into the transaction category, account balance category, right? Okay, so uh, we're gonna see how they'll fall into the category starting with transactions. Okay, and we take a look and let's take a look at existence. And they tell us, and they use the word vouch. I stay away from the word vouch and trace, even though it's legitimate use of those words. The exam is not nearly as careful about talking about vouching for existence versus tracing for completeness. So I don't want you to get locked into memorizing a word. But for the existence occurrence assertion, look what they're telling us to do. Take a sample of transactions from the sales journal to the sales invoice, to the customer order, and the shipping documents. Is that what we just did for existence? Okay. That's the classic existence test. For completeness, again, I don't want to focus on words like vouch and trace a sample of shipping documents to the invoice and then to the sales journal for the existence, I mean, excuse me, completeness assertion. Question. Okay, now they talk about cutoff here. Now, a couple of things to realize about cutoff. We wanna make sure that sales were recorded in the proper period. So we're going to select some transactions just before year end and just after year end to see if they were recorded in the correct period. So we're going to probably be looking at some transactions that happened in December, some that happened in January, of course, they're assuming a December 31st year end. Now, when we look at these, okay, there's a couple of things, something else about cutoff. Cutoff only appears in the transaction category. Because when we look at what, when we look at the account balances, it doesn't matter what year it's happened. If it's recording the account balance, the question is, should it be? It doesn't matter what year. Whereas for cutoff is specifically focusing on in what year was the transaction recorded? Was it recorded? When did it occur? And is it recorded in the correct period? Okay. So they tell us that we should look at a sample of sales invoices from shortly before and they tell us we should sample them and do what with them, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's break it into before versus after. For before, look at shipping terms, okay? So if something is free on board, shipping point and it is shipped 1231 and arrives arrives to the client's customer on one three I guess I better say the year huh 2022 and it shows up on 1323. Is it a sale? Yes. Yes, that's a sale because it was a sale as soon as it got on the truck, right? Okay, good. If it's free on board, destination. I'm going to put dest because I can't fit destination in there. If it's free on board destination and it can turn these terms, is it a sale? No. 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 
Okay, okay, good. Easy enough, but just so you understand, that's what they mean by looking at the shipping terms. And then they really don't call out what it is that you're doing here with these happen after year end. Because if something happened after year end, okay, and let's see how I want to write the procedure for after year end. Guys, bear with me. I think there's room over here for after year end. Okay, what do we want to do for after year end? And um, if it is shipped, One three twenty twenty three and arrives one seven twenty twenty three. Is that a twenty twenty two sale? No, no, it wasn't even shipped yet. So why am I bothering myself with things that was sh shipped after your end? And so the procedure there that you're doing is, and that's what I want you to flashcard for the after year end ones, okay? The flashcard, the yields here. Um, account for sequence. That says account for sequence of shipping documents. What does that mean? Okay, what happens? Account for sequence of shipping documents. Well, what does that mean? Okay, um, if the last shipping document used in 2022 is number 300, what should be the first one used? in 2023 not a trick question 301 301 well what if you perform the procedure you account for the sequence you see the last one used in 2022 was 300 you're satisfied with that one and then the first shipping document used in uh 2023 is 305 what would you say to him i'd ask what happened to one through four yeah where's one through four and they say Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. Those should have been sales of the previous year, and we forgot to put those in or something, right? Again, they didn't include them in the right period. Now, again, they overstated the sales. Uh, they understated the sales by not putting them in in 2022 in this example. But why? What's going on? Okay, that's a cutoff procedure. You take transactions close to year end. You look at those both before and after, for the befores, you're really focusing on the shipping terms. For the afters, you're doing what? As I've asked you to flash card, you're accounting for the sequence of the shipping documents. Question. Okay. Let me ask you a different question. What happens? I'm just going to write this in. What happens if... What could be the cause of physical inventory count being higher? than the accounting records. So you count the, you, you know, you, you're, you're happy with the physical count and it shows an amount that's higher than what the accounting records are saying the inventory should be. Maybe some inventory was not credited out when it was shipped. If inventory was not credited out when it was shipped, then the accounting records would be higher, right? Cogs is understated. Cost of goods sold is understated. Cost of goods sold is understated, meaning I debited 
cost of goods sold, I credited inventory. And so, yeah, well, I, well, okay, but why would have I have done that? I mean, that's like phantom accounting entries that you just described to me. If I debited cost of goods sold, credit inventory, and didn't do anything, then the question is why? <laughs> So you may have had a missed entry, though. I mean, if, if you shipped something out, you need to credit inventory, and maybe you didn't. Or it could be inventory that has not been shipped. So we've got missing accounting entries, and we've got... Could it be as possible it just uh, wasn't shipped to the customer by accident? That happened. So, so now we've uh, got people putting busy. stuff on a truck for no reason, okay? Goods held on consignment? Um, well, if it's out on consignment, then our physical inventory should be less, right? No, like if we're holding it for someone else. Oh, okay. That could be a cause. Or be sales return, that's not being recorded. Huh? Sales returns that okay. have been recorded. Good. And, and I don't know, that last one that that uh, Michael gave consignment is good. Some of these other things, guys, are kind of like falling off the edge of something that's probably not going to happen. But the, the sales return, that's probably the cause of that, right? Because when they have a sales return, they're supposed to do what? Debit sales return and credit the account receivable. And they're supposed to do what? debit the inventory and credit the cost of goods sold. And if they're not doing that, then there's going to be a higher physical count than the actual inventory, right? Yes, that happens. So that's okay. several times. That's the more likely occurrence because they're sitting there and they don't, they don't even book the returns. Okay, these other things that they're kind of just generating journal entries out of the air or this idea that, you know, they're they're sitting there and they're recording journal entries for things that didn't happen that's causing them to reduce their inventory and stuff i'm not saying that uh so much as not booking returns because then you see the shipping documents going out and everything but if they're not booking returns then you kind of mess yourself up so if you were to see that that would be a reason to take a good look at the sales return so let's just go ahead and put down uh investigate sales returns. Okay, and I know the book doesn't say that anywhere, but I had a dream that that was something that they asked in a task-based simulation on the auditing exam that they wanted you to come up with some reasons that would potentially um, explain that. Okay, and the sales return one is the big one. Okay, all right, good. Now you come over and uh, when we talk about uh, valuation. Um, yeah, okay, let's look at valuation right here. When we look at valuation, okay, then, uh, okay, what did they do? Oh, okay, no, that's my bad. Never mind up there. It's down here. Okay, so let's look now at accounts receivable. So the related accounts, sales, accounts receivable, right? Okay. And when you look at the existence assertion, okay, we're going to look at confirmation of accounts receivable, and that will come later, okay? For the uh, valuation, the auditor should examine the results of confirmation for test of accuracy and test of the adequacy of the allowance accounts. No, 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 no. And I don't know why they took that out. It's in the old book and it's not there. Absolutely, that's fucking wrong. Okay, no, absolutely not. Cross that out. Okay, that is... Um, confirmation 
is not a way of testing the adequacy and allowance for doubtful accounts. I don't know what they're talking about. Just because someone tells you that the, the client's customer tells you that they owe you money does not mean that they have the ability to pay. Okay, so what they need to put here, okay, is this is an accounting estimate. This is an accounting estimate. And for this accounting estimate, they need to do what? They need to recalculate allowance. Okay, so for accounts receivable, it's just the opposite of what they're saying here. The confirmation is not a test evaluation. I mean, the person can tell you all day, yes, I owe $50,000, but if they can't pay it, so what? To get to the valuation of the accounts receivable, you need to uh, do the accounting estimate, recalculate the allowance. Whoever wrote that was smoking crack. Okay, that's not that's not correct. Okay, let's look at rights and obligations though, and let's flashcard that. That's annoying. Hang on a minute. Okay, I'm sending an email on that first thing. To me. That's, that's nonsense. Okay, um, let's go ahead and let's take a look at um, rights and obligations. And this one is fine. The auditor should review bank confirmation and debt agreements for all liens on receivables. And the auditor should inquire of management and review debt agreements and board minutes for evidence that accounts receivable have been sold or factored. So sometimes there will be a situation where maybe they're still showing the receivable on the books. It's been factored, but there should be uh, or, or used as collateral against the loan. But there should be some sort of disclosure in the financial statements that's showing that they have, you know, um, somehow um, um, put a lien on those accounts receivable. Okay, so do flashcard that under the rights and obligations assertion. Okay, now we come over and let's take a look at account receivable uh, confirmation, okay? And um, account receivable confirmation for the accounts receivable, okay, is required general accepting accounting procedure unless the receivables are in material. Confirmation would be ineffective or an inherent and control risk are very low um, risk of material misstatement is very low and provided other procedures sufficient to reduce audit risk to acceptably low level. Now, when they talk about other procedure, okay, other procedure, a classic one, okay, that you can put up here somewhere, is subsequent collection review. Sorry, guys, that's very sloppy. Let me rewrite that. <laughs> we still got me shaky from the fact that they said that the confirmation is good for evaluation. Uh, subsequent collection review. Okay, subsequent collection review is an other procedure, okay, that you could apply there. So what happens? You're looking and you're saying, well, I want to confirm accounts receivable. For some reason, the client says, hey, don't confirm the account receivable. Is there something else you can do? Alternative procedure would be that you could go and see if they need to be needing to look at collections that would probably happen, in, say, January, February, assuming a December 31st year end, and see if they collected on it. If they did, that's good evidence that what? That that receivable had existence because somebody paid on it. It met the definition of an asset. It had future economic benefit that the cash came. So you can go ahead and use that as an alternative procedure. Okay. And the auditor must document 
how the omission of the procedure was alternatively tested, and that would be a good example. Okay, so flashcard the reasons that you may not confirm accounts receivable, but it is a required procedure unless you can do some other procedure. You had some other reason. If it's not material, you don't even need to test it. Okay, but let's just go ahead and let's take a look at positive confirmation. And with positive confirmation, okay, um, the customers are requested to return the statement directly to the auditor, indicating whether they agree with the amount and uh, provide information about any exceptions, okay? Uh, that's positive confirmation. And they tell us that positive confirmation should be used if there are large individual uh, accounts. In other words, there are some large material ones. There are expected errors are when internal control is weak. So what are they telling you there? If they're saying you expect errors, in this account balance and internal control is weak. What are they telling you is up? Uh, risk of material misstatement is high. Good. And we've got something that's very material, right? Because those two things work in concert. Good. Risk of material is up. So what needs to be down? Detection risk. Detection risk needs to be down. So what needs to be up? Uh, substantive testing with nature, extent, and timing. Good. Substantive. Testing is up and you say nature? Nature, extent, and timing. So is that a nature, an extent, or a timing thing? That would be extent. No, that's nature. The nature of the confirmation uh, oh. being positive is its nature, right? Of what it does. It gives you more reliable evidence because they have to respond, don't they? Yes. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I thought we were talking about like, if when expected errors are high, you would want to have a larger sample. Well, um, if you have lower risk of material mistake, uh, if you have a higher, excuse me, risk of material mistake, and you're trying to lower your detection risk, nature, you're going to use positive confirmation, extent, probably have a larger sample size, timing, you'll probably be doing that testing at year end, right? Or a combination thereof. All right. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now they say no, that positive confirmation may also be blank, which means the recipient is requested to fill in the balance. So with positive confirmation, you may state the balance, just ask them to check a box. With blank positive, you make them fill in the amount. So that's what giving you even more. Let me have that first. I need uh, to check something. Excuse me. And then okay, that's giving you what? That's giving you even more evidence as to what? As to the existence of that account receivable. Okay, this is all about existence. Um, but be aware that you may get lower responses from that because what? You're essentially giving your client's customer homework, aren't you? Do you like homework? Neither does anybody else. So you're probably going to have to chase them more to get that response. Okay. Now, confirmation responses uh, that come in electronic form, such as emails, should be verified by calling the sender. These days, um, and, you know, and then they say mail the original directly to the auditor. These days, a lot of times what you do is you create a secure system where they can simply upload their response and then only the auditor has access to that. Okay. Um, now, note that confirmations provide what? Provide good evidence regarding the existence and rights and obligations. They do not provide reliable evidence regarding valuation because customers may confirm a balance despite the inability to pay. Then why did they have confirmation up there under the valuation assertion? <laughs> okay. See my point? Okay. Now, negative confirmation. Okay. With negative confirmation, um, now... The customers are requested to respond to the auditor only if they disagree 
with the stated amount. So you're not going to hear from them unless they disagree. Now, they say that negative confirmation is reliable. And let's go ahead and flashcard this. If the combined assessed level of inherent risk is low, and why they don't put somewhere in parentheses here, which is RMM, thank you, okay? If RMM is, um, let's see, RMM is down now, what can be up? Detection risk. Detection risk can come up, good. What can come down? Substantive testing. Substantive testing, good. Which we have now articulated in detail as nature, extent, timing. So blank confirmation is what? I mean, excuse me, not blank. Negative confirmation is an example of what? A nature that is down, but we accept it if what? If our RMM is low, which they have articulated as a combined inherent risk and control risk, a large number of small account balances are being confirmed, and there's no reason to expect that recipients will ignore them. And I just kind of laugh at that one. But um, if you're auditing, say, PG&E, and PG&E has, what, millions of customers, what are you going to do? Send out positive confirmation to a representative sample? Of course not. So what would you do? You would sit there and say negative, okay? And presumably, I guess, PG&E would have good internal control over their accounting records. I don't know about their where their gas lines are or whatever, um, but, um, you know, uh, <laughs> for the accounting records, that should be effective, okay? And again, it's less, um, it's less effective than positive, but if we have low RMM, we might be able to accept that, okay? Okay, good, come over. And let's take a look at um, the next page and um, take a look at um, confirmation exceptions. And again, thank you for another annoying installment here, Becker, but let's look at this. Um, timing differences occur when there is a uh, delay in recording the transaction by the client or their customer. For example, an entity may correctly record a receivable on December 31st when the goods are shipped to the customer, but the customer may not record the payable until the goods are received on January 5th. They say this is not a misstatement under what circumstance? When is that not a misstatement? They say it is not a misstatement. They say that like God came down and said, anytime this happens, this is not a misstatement. Could this scenario be a misstatement on the part of the client? I think it depends on the whether it's shipping point or destination. Right. Correct, Eric. That's exactly right. This is a mis not a misstatement if the shipping terms, <laughs> right? If shipping terms are what? FOB shipping point. If the shipping terms were FOB destination, this is a misstatement, right? Okay, so they just shouldn't say that this is not a misstatement. Okay, okay, good. Come over and let's take a look at confirmation non-responses. And confirmation non-responses will be followed up on, okay? Uh, sometimes you may even ask the client to intervene. That does not mean that the confirmation comes from the customer, client's customer to the client, then to you. That means you ask them to tell them to respond directly to you, okay? When the confirmation responses are not received, the auditor should perform alternative procedure, maybe what? Maybe a subsequent cash receipt, okay? Assuming that comes in on time, okay? Um, that's enough, okay? So you should follow up. However, you can, if you never get a response, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, add us come to look at some different things there, okay? Subsequent collection. Uh, presentation and disclosure, okay? And again, are there related parties receivables? 
Uh, are there pledged or discounted receivables would be things that you would expect there to be proper disclosure of. And I say again, we talked about related party transactions earlier. Okay, a lot of information on the revenue cycle. Unfortunately, <laughs> they um, only give us one question for an area that would be heavy on the exam. But let's go ahead and let's just take a look at least at this question. Okay, looks like most of us have had a chance to uh, look at this one. So let's go ahead and uh, see that most of us got it right. Um, the problem with using blank positive, where you're asking the client's custo customer to fill in the account balance, is you are likely, correct answer was D, which most of us got, to receive less responses because now people have to research to see, well, what was it uh, that we owe the, uh, the, your client, what the co client's customer owes your client. And, you know, maybe they're receiving that confirmation in January and you're asking them at December 31st. So they may have to go back through some records to figure out what that amount was and put the amount in. And they may keep saying, yeah, we're going to get to that. And then they don't. Okay. Uh, subsequent cash receipts do not need to be verified as long as you get the response. If you don't get the response, then that might be an alternative procedure. But that's not something that, um, you know, you're necessarily going to have to do. You wouldn't have to do that for the ones you receive, assuming they put the right amount down. Okay. Okay, good. Let's come over and let's take a look at our next module here, our expenditure cycle. Okay. Now, what happens? We're talking about uh, purchases first. Okay. We're going to be purchasing our inventory and we're going to be separating authorization, record keeping, and custody. It doesn't have to be inventory, by the way, guys. It could be purchases of any goods or services that we need. It could be purchase of equipment, whatever. Okay, so what happens? The purchase requisition begins the purchasing cycle and the department in need of the asset or services sends the properly approved serially numbered requisition to the purchasing department. Authorization, record keeping, or custody? Authorization. That's an authorization. Hey, I'm the head of the IT department and I need 35 laptops. Whatever. Okay. Now, the requisitioning department, the department in need, should not have the authority to actually place the order. This would indicate a weakness in internal control. Okay. What happens? 
the history has shown us that if you let the head of the IT department direct speak directly to the uh, you know computer vendor, whatever, a chummy relationship develops. And all of a sudden, as well, you know, we might charge a little more. By the way, would you like some tickets to the Warrior game? Da, 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 da. And this kind of relationship starts to develop. So what do we do? We send the purchase order to the purchasing department. And the purchasing department should do what? Should make sure the best price is obtained. We set that up so that that purchasing agent's you know, evaluation is based on how good a price they get us for something, okay? So is that authorization record keeping or custody? Authorization. Good, excellent guys, that's another authorization step, okay? Now, once they have gone ahead and they've found that best price, there will be multiple copies of the purchase order Okay, pre-numbered purchase order, and there will be multiple copies. One is sent to the original requisitioning department. The second is sent, it doesn't have to be one, two, you don't have to remember one, two, but another copy is sent to the vendor. Another is sent to the receiving department, so they know this thing, whatever it is, is going to come in, and one to the accounting department so that they know, hey, there's going to be an invoice coming, there's going to be an account payable, Okay. Okay, good. Go ahead and flashcard. And guys, again, I typically don't like to ask you to flashcard a, a set of documents associated with any one transaction, but some of them I will because I've seen enough questions now about these documents that you might as well have a flashcard of what happens. Okay, now what happens? You come over and another flashcard item, they tell us that it is preferable that the copy of the purchase order uh, sent to the receiving department, um, okay, will not indicate the quantity, thus they are forced to count the goods upon arrival to know how many were supposed to come in. Now, why do you think we do that? Why do you think they're suggesting that the entity should have that internal control? Well, if like an extra one gets sent, they don't hold that to the side, take it home instead of reporting it. Did you grow up in Hayward? Okay. <laughs> I say that because I'm from Hayward. I thought only people from Hayward knew that trick, right? If it says more, that extra one's going home, isn't it? Okay. It says, I mean, it says less. It's, it says, hey, there's supposed to be um 25 laptops here and they send 30 that extra five is going in the trunk of someone's car and they're just checking off the 25 right and good luck what ended up happening right so you want them to count and fill in that there's 25 okay good okay and then we will set up the accounts payable authorization record keeping or custody record keeping yeah and authorization yeah. Uh, it's more of a record keeping function. I mean, that would be officially okay. I, I understand what you're saying that we're going to look to see that it all matches up, but we're doing record keeping now. Okay. Okay, good. Now we come over and you take a look and we say approving the invoice. Okay. And so when the invoice arrives, the accounting department approves it, which is sounding like authorization, but it's record keeping okay, officially the way you know, the exam would look at uh, by matching the invoice, purchase order, receiving report, and the requisition, okay? So they match all that up, and then they say that what? Then we come down and we say that um, over here, approved voucher packets, that's what that is, the approved voucher package which matched the invoice purchase order receiving report and requisition prepared by the accounting department are received by the treasurer who prepares, signs, and mails, checks, and cancels all supporting documents, okay? Go ahead and flashcard here that what, that the, um, approved voucher packets, well, I just highlighted that, are received by the tre treasurer and the treasurer does what? They send the payment 
and just flashcard all that. Okay, they send the payment, but it's the treasurer is what I'm trying to get to here. The treasurer is the one who does that. Is this authorization, record keeping, or custody? Authorization. Yeah, it's an authorization to pay, but it's also what? It's also separating the custody, if you will, of the cash, okay? The ability to cause the cash to go out with the, um, from the record keeping, which is done by the accounting uh, department, right? Okay, so yeah, you're right. Officially, it is an authorization step, but I kind of almost see it as custody, right? Okay, good. And then the paid vouchers are returned to the accounting department for posting, and so that's what they say to us up there, and you can come back up. When payment is made, the payable is reversed. In other words, what? We debit the account payable, we credit the cash, right? Okay, okay, good. Now, let me ask you a question. What year does it sound like we're in here? where the treasurer is signing checks. It says, ideally, invoices should be paid by check. Do you write checks? Very rarely. Very rarely. You write a check when what? You got to pay a parking ticket or something stupid like that? Or when, the, when, or when the State Board of Accountancy requires that you send them a check to register for the exam? Something stupid like that. Otherwise, what? You're rarely sending checks. So, so your customers at an auditor probably have some sort of, you know, online banking, electronic funds transfer, et cetera, right? So could you accomplish this same separation of duty in an IT environment? Yes. Yeah. What would you do? Yes, well, we have different yeah, roles for different functions where they cannot access uh, different roles as exactly. right. uh, violation. Yeah, your IT access has different access for different people. Good, excellent, guys, excellent. So somebody that can release payments shouldn't be allowed to update the accounting records, right? No right. Separation of duty inside of the IT system. Good. So hearing that, that's very good. That's excellent. Hearing that, would that lead you then to the idea of what we've said before, that if you have a highly automated environment, then you may have to do some control testing because you won't have all these pretty little documents to look at to see that they were all canceled and all that. So what would you do? You would go to the security officer, which you're indicating, the IT security officer, and you'd say, please give me the listing of rights of people in this system and make sure there's no incompatible rights. That's a control test that you would have to do in an IT environment when you may not have all these pretty documents floating around, checks that are canceled and all that, right? Okay, good, excellent. Okay, now you come over and for some reason, they stopped calling out what the function is on the top part of the flow chart here that I want you to flashcard. But let's just go ahead and say purchasing, and I'm just going to use the first letter, authorization, record keeping, or custody? Authorization. Good. Receiving department, custody. Accounts payable, we've said is what? Record keeping. And we've said that what? That the treasurer is the one that is really having the authorization. You can put authorization to what? To pay. Okay, all right, good. Don't worry, this is silly. You can't memorize this flow chart. Okay, I understand the process, but you can't sit there and memorize the whole flow chart. If there were key documents, I asked you to flashcard them. Okay, okay, good. Now, again, testing control procedures by department, and they talk about, they talk about the sample, and they leave out what? What assertion are we looking for here? Okay, which is the most important thing? What assertion are these controls helping us with? Okay, so I'm not in love with this summary table. You can scan it. I've already shown you the different departments as they relate to authorization, record keeping, or custody. Okay. All right. And then they leave out the treasurer <laughs> down here. <laughs> 
Jesus. Okay, let's just move on. Oh, here's the treasure. Okay. But they don't put them down here. Oh, yeah, treasure. Okay, so they're, all right, well, that's interesting. They're saying that the treasure has custody of cash, which I did kind of say that, but there are a lot of auditing textbooks that would say that that is a uh, authorization function. Uh, so I agree more with you, David, than I do the book there. But um, what you could do if you want to is kind of, you know, put a slash custody down there. Okay. You know, Becker hired a bunch of new people. And uh, the problem with hiring new people is then you got to give them something to do. Okay, so let's just come over and let's come down. And sometimes they may not know what they're doing. Okay, but let's come over and let's take a look at performing specific procedures. And now they're talking about what kind of procedures? Substantive procedures. Okay, and let's start to take a look at some of these and for completeness. Okay, and again, they give that point that we're more worried about a completeness for account payable than we are for existence because of the risk. And what risk they don't say, they obviously don't mean the risk of material misstatement because you could have a high risk of material misstatement for any of the assertions and respond accordingly. From the business risk, we're more uh, concerned about the, com uh, the completeness assertion for accounts payable, because if you leave out an accounts payable, you're probably also leaving out an expenditure, leave out a liability, you're overstating the net worth of the company, you leave out an expenditure, retained earnings is overstated, net income is overstated, my net income uh, my net income is going to be overstated. My retained earnings will be overstated. So I'm increasing the net worth of the company. Uh, not a good thing, right? Okay. So, because um, now somebody could pay too much for the stock. Okay. So from the business risk, yeah, there could be just as much risk of a misstatement if they don't have good controls over the completeness assertion. There could be more risk over the completeness assertion if they don't have good controls over the completeness assertion and less risk of material misstatement if they had better controls um, over um, the other way around. There could be more risk associated with the existence assertion if you didn't feel the controls were good with the existence assertion. So I wouldn't just say risk in general, okay? Now, with the business risk, yes. Now, come over, though, and let's look at completeness, because that is something that we want to definitely, you know, we're worried about. And so um, they tell us here, perform a search for unrecorded liabilities. Unrecorded means completeness. And the auditor should select disbursements made subsequent to year end and examine the supporting document. And the auditor is looking for items that should have been recorded, but were not. That's the completeness assertion, right? So let's see. I need some space somewhere. I'll do it right here. So let's say I'm looking at 20, 22 financial statements. Okay. And they have account payable number one, and that's listed for 100,000. They have account payable number two, and that's listed for 70,000. They have account payable number three, and that's listed for 50,000. And then they have account payable, um, okay, that's it, okay. Then, in 2023, they list cash disbursement number one for 100,000, cash disbursement number two for 70,000, cash disbursement number three for 50,000, and cash disbursement number 17 here is for 10 million. Now what happens? The auditor is looking at this accounts payable balance and we're worried about what? Completeness. So what do we do? 
we come over and we look at the 2023 disbursements, the subsequent year, and we're probably, by the way, I say 2023, we're talking what? Because we got this audit done, we're talking about January, February, probably whatever. And they come over and they match that one up. Okay, good. There was a disbursement and there was a payable listed there. They match that one up. Good. There was a disbursement and we can relate that to that particular payable. We go ahead, we see that disbursement, we can relate it to that payable. This test is going pretty good. And then we see this one for number 17 for 10 million and we look for it. Is it there? No. It's not there. We say, hey, look, we saw a disbursement handed in January, February, a pretty big one, 10 million. Uh, what happened? Oh, that was bomb. You're right. That should have been listed as a payable and it was not. We'll fix that. What's happening to my professional skepticism? Going up. The light is flashing. Why? What's the problem here? And we start to ask some more questions about that. Okay. But we found that by going what? From disbursements, the records of disbursements back to the accounting records for the year under audit to see what's going on there. Good. Okay. So flashcard that. That is a classic completeness test. Okay. Um, now we go and we take a look and we should also examine open vouchers and we're looking to see you know how come it's not recorded as a liability is it that they haven't received the stuff yet or is it that they received the stuff and they didn't record the payoff okay um particularly we're interested in what we're interested in these open orders that have been around for a long time. You know, they opened the order in, back in January. Here it is, December. Hey, did you get this stuff? What is it? Is it a special made good? It takes a long time to produce. Why is this taking so long for you to get this? Oh, we got it already. Okay, then record the payable. Okay. Okay, good. Now we come over and... Um, they tell us here another annoying point under existence or occurrence. And this edit in here, uh, this information they put in here is because I beat them into submission on this one. But they said account payable confirmation are not required because strong internal external evidence supports accounts payable is generally available. However, confirmation of accounts payable may be sent when control is weak and when there are disputed amounts or when monthly vendor statements are not available, okay? Typically, vendors with small or zero balances will be selected for confirmation. Now, they put this under existence or occurrence. If you are sending out a confirmation, look up uh, items that are low or zero balance, are you looking to see if it should be less than zero? Not normally. Well, would, would you perform a procedure to see if something is less than zero? It, they're reporting it as a positive amount. You want to see if it's a negative amount? No, you want to see if it's more than zero. And they'll tell you that it's more than zero because they want to get paid, right? Right, you're looking for one that is more than zero. Therefore, is it an existence test? No, it would be a completeness test, wouldn't it? It's a completeness test because I'm saying it should be more, shouldn't it? Okay, so they didn't have this note before I pointed that out to them. Okay, and then they added this note. And they say, well, even though confirmations in general are an existence test here, the confirmation would be the completeness test, but because we're stubborn, we're gonna insist on putting it under the existence assertion, okay? But it is really what? A completeness test, isn't it? Okay, now you come over and you take a look and they tell us that when you use accounts payable confirmation, you should use blank positive, okay? To determine if accounts payable are understated, again, indicating that it's a completeness test. Now, flashcard that. But let's think about that for a second, because this is kind of interesting. When you have a blank positive confirmation, you send 
to your client's vendor now and you send it in the voice of your client and it says how much do I owe you? And it'll be blank. If somebody sent you a note like that, how careful would you be to make sure that you identify exactly how much they owe you? Probably not super careful. Super careful. Can I borrow some money, Michael? Because <laughs> if I send you that note and you're not going to be very careful to see how much I owe you, well, you're a very nice guy and I know you are. <laughs> no, you're going to look all over. He says he owes us money. Really? You're going to be looking under every rock possible to see what the amount is, right? In other words, your client's vendor does a completeness test for you, don't they? Hello? Yeah. Okay. In their records, they sit there and they do a completeness test for you and send it back to you. So again, you know, uh, note that it's blank positive and that is confirming all the more that this is what, this is more of a completeness test than an existence test. Okay. Now auditing purchase transactions. Okay. And let's take a look for the completeness and we will take a sample of vouchers. Okay to the purchases journal okay so if they sat there and they had a vouchers is it in the purchases journal right okay and um yeah i don't know you can flashcard that i guess okay for existence we're going to go the other way take the um the sample of vouchers and to confirm the proper uh presence of the receiving report Okay, and those aren't the most wonderful procedures I've ever seen. Okay, uh, auditing presentation and disclosure. Okay, do we have purchase contracts, related party purchases and payables? Okay, and um, yeah, that's enough. Okay, all right, good. Let's take a look though at this question and this really is one of my favorite becker questions of all time okay cpa exam questions of all time whatever so let's look at this one i really like this question so i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to turn you loose on it, and then we're going to go through it together
Okay, looks like most of us have had a good chance to take a look at this. And great, guys, this is excellent results, okay? Because this is not the easiest question, okay? So let's go through it just to see that there's a couple of different ways that you might have uh, attacked this. And I guess I have to stop sharing the poll and kind of take that off the screen. Okay, good. And so what happens? Auditor suspects that certain client employees are ordering merchandise for themselves over the internet without whatever, I don't care how they're ordering it, without recording the purchase. What assertion? Completeness. Good, this is completeness. If you don't record something in the books, the books are not complete, right? With me so far. So if it is um, without recording the purchase, where should I start? Should I start from source documents? If it's the completeness assertion, should I start from source documents or from the or from the um, the ledgers from the financial statements? Source docs. Good. Now, when I look at the choices, are those all source documents? Yep. Those are all documents. So now I got to figure out, well, what's the best document? Okay. Now, when I look at these, I start looking and I'm like, well, okay, there's the vendor's invoice. Okay. That's an external document. There's receiving reports and there's approved vouchers. Those are both what? Internal documents, aren't they? Okay. So I get rid of these two, but then I start looking at this cash disbursement and the cash disbursement is going to do what? It's going to show up as a check that was written maybe, but it definitely will show as a subtract from what? From the bank statement? Is the bank statement an external document? Yeah. It's an external document that I can what? pretty much get a direct confirmation back from the client's bank. In fact, I will do that, right? So that disbursement is emerging here as what? The best piece of evidence here because the, the, the vendor is not gonna play. The vendor is gonna say, where's my money? And eventually you're gonna have to pay them, aren't they? Aren't you? So even if they somehow hid the disbursement from you by hiding the check or destroying the check, at some point you're going to see that that got subtracted from the bank statements and how come, right? Okay, now that's the logic, the auditing way, starting with the assertion, understanding the best document to help, to help test that assertion. But there's also the reading comprehension approach, okay? Because they say, that they are not recording the receipt of the goods. No receiving report. When the vendor's invoice arrives, one of the employees approves the invoice for payment after the invoices are paid. So we know they're gonna pay it. So the disbursement will show on the bank statement. The employee destroys the invoice. Won't be able to look at that. And the related vouchers won't be able to look at that. That disbursement is going to happen and it's going to show up on a document that I can obtain directly externally from the client's customer and understand what that disbursement was for. Aha, it was for an unauthorized disbursement for which there's no voucher, no receiving report, no vendor's invoice. And I'm here to tell you that once you find that one, people start ratting each other out because there was collusion here, wasn't there? Okay, but people start ratting each other out pretty quickly when you find one of them. Question. Okay, good. That's good progress. We are going to finish hopefully chapter four next time. We will pick up with module three. In the meantime, we're done with chapter three. So you can do that module on the data analytics. And you're gonna see a fair number of questions in the first two modules. So we've got a good leg up on chapter four now, okay? Any questions?
No? Okay, guys, if there are no questions, we'll call it an evening and I will see you next Thursday. Okay. Keep Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night.